we're thinking about um, the physical and biological universe uh, in which we live and on which all uh, life systems uh, are dependent, it comes down to two things. One is energy and the other is matter. And we're going to be talking about the, uh, the matter side. And uh, that's where green chemistry comes in. That's where uh, the work of method comes in that Adam is going to talk about. And uh, it's essential element of uh, sustainability, but you don't actually often hear it about it all that often uh, relative uh, to uh, the discussions about energy. And sort of it reminded me uh, in Ms. Chen's presentation of her uh, mishap on the way to the hospital uh, of the three engineers on their way to the conference uh, when their car broke down and they pulled over to the side of the road and the mechanical engineer said, it's obviously a power problem. We're not getting power from the engine to the wheels. Uh, the chemical engineer said, it's a, it's a fuel problem. We have a, a, uh, impurities in the fuel. And the software engineer said, no, no, let's get out of the car, get back in and slam the doors. <laughs> and so, um, so the, the problem of sustainability is we're looking at uh, this issue um, and, so, and the, the sort of investment and innovation world through all of these different lenses. And so this is the lens uh, of green chemistry. And I, I want to start it uh, with the first slide, if you could pull that up, please. So uh, in 2005, next slide, the Environmental Working Group found 287 synthetic chemicals in the umbilical cord blood of, of 10 babies. Um, again, sort of um, uh, referring back to Ms. Chen's presentation, um, these were uh, uh, synthetic substances that consisted of um, uh, products, chemicals derived from products, uh, from pollutants, uh, and from pesticides. And the numbers uh, to the right are the various congeners um, of those substances. Ah. Thank you. Great. Uh, of these 287 chemicals, 180 cause cancer in humans or animals. 217 are toxic to the brain or nervous system, uh, and 208 cause birth defects or abnormal development in animals. Um, this, the sort of the implications of uh, chemical exposures that occur during development um, in utero are the, the sort of uh, frontier of the environmental health sciences. Uh, understanding the implications of this uh, because we know that um, these are bioactive substances, um, many of them are toxic, and, and biological systems and physical systems um, uh, um, respond precipitously at certain points, uh, including in these kinds of systems, including uh, during the exquisite biologically complicated process of fetal development. So. Uh, there's been great interest uh, and great need for investment in the design, the development, the commercial success of safer alternatives, and more broadly, uh, the concept and the science of green chemistry. And there have been four um, factors that have locked uh, this really, I think, promising um, arena um, out of the chemicals market. And I'll just uh, briefly walk through those. One is information asymmetries, that the sellers and buyers of industrial chemicals and, and chemicals that are introduced into products and th that make up the material basis of our society are not required to generate and disclose information on the hazardous properties of those chemicals as a condition of having them on the market. So the sellers have more information than the buyers, and buyers are making poor choices. It's one of the reasons that we're seeing uh, pollutants and product chemicals uh, in human blood and in, uh, in uh, umbilical cord blood. Very ineffective governance, uh, well established. The EPA has been able to take effective rulemaking, if you will, on six of the 82,000 chemicals in commercial uh, use. Uh, government public agencies carry the burden of proof, uh, and it's overly burdensome, very difficult to meet. The fourth, of course, is sunk investments by chemical producers. Um, 35 years ago, we set up a policy structure that, uh, that never required chemical manufacturers, chemical designers, producers, to generate, to disclose, to understand the hazardous properties of the chemicals they were putting out on the market. Uh, and so that set of conditions exists today. The market grew up based on the function, price, and performance of chemicals. 
with very little attention, if any, in some cases, given to uh, hazardous properties. Uh, and finally, minimal research, innovation, and, ed and education in green chemistry. So across the country today, not surprisingly, you can earn a PhD in chemistry in all of our colleges and universities and not de demonstrate a basic understanding of, of uh, toxicology, environmental fate, exposure, et cetera, uh, related to, uh, to chemistry. So it's a big market, about 74 billion pounds a day that are produced uh, or imported uh, in the US. About 700 new chemicals enter the market each year. And 90% of about 11,000 of the chemicals that are in commercial use uh, in any substantive volume are made uh, using oil. This is the link, of course, to energy. So think about that, that 90% of the chemicals that make up the material basis of our society that, that, uh, that go into the products that we use, into the industrial processes to make things, um, uh, uh, are made using oil. And of course, this is the, uh, the, re the recent uh, Chevron uh, refinery fire of August 6th uh, last year. Second, the chemical market is growing. Global chemical production is doubling every 24 years. Uh, with about 3% growth per year, and this is what this looks like on the orange bars <coughs> juxtaposed, I'm sorry, on the blue bars juxtaposed against uh, projected global population growth leading up to, uh, to 2050. So the problems uh, that we're experiencing today are on our current trajectory are going to broaden and deepen. So uh, change is breaking out, and this is my last, uh, last two uh, images here. The first is uh, that this month um, Target announced their sustainable product standard at 1,700 stores. They're requiring precise ingredient disclosure for 7,500 chemically formulated products uh, in their stores. They're screening 1,600 of those chemicals for health risks. Uh, they're screening 1,500 of them for water quality risks and they're rating products from one to 100 for advertising and shelf uh, placement. Government is trying to catch up, and we can talk about that. Uh, but this, I think, is an important uh, development that is going to drive interest and innovation and companies that are marketing products uh, that have chemicals that are, form that are, that are showing up I mean, in, umbil in umbilical cord blood and in, in human blood um, are I need to be paying attention uh, to this. The question then is, the four market factors I believe are starting to break up. Is it becoming possible to develop and market useful chemicals that will not appear in umbilical cord blood? For example, can society commit to protecting uh, child neurodevelopment? So with that, um, thank you. And I want to turn it over to, uh, to Adam to talk about how Method has been uh, working in this space. Thank you very much. So the question for Adam is, why is this a great time to be learning about and investing in green chemistry, and how has Method been so successful with doing so? Well, I'll take the first second, or the first question, second question first, yeah. sorry. Um, I, I think the reason Method's been successful is because we use greener, green chemistry and bro the broader pr principles of sustainable product design just simply as an aspect of quality of our products. So we believe in just simply building the very best product that you can make. That needs to also be the most sustainable product. I have a background in green chemistry that helps. Um, and so we bring the technical factors along with also some aesthetic and design factors as well to create just a better product. And what that has done for us is it's opened up appeal of our product to a much broader audience than is, is typical with a green product. I've always believed that uh, making green products for green people is pointless. And so our, our brand appeals to a much more mainstream audience. And by bringing green to the mainstream, we've been able to grow the business more quickly than other people that are also focused on green chemistry, I think. As for the second question, I'm extremely excited about the whole new world that's opening up to us in green chemistry right now. If you think about it, for the first time since the Industrial Revolution, the way that we make things is fundamentally changing in a, in a, in a very radical way. So 
150 years ago, we started making things out of petroleum as a byproduct of the fuel industry, as, as was mentioned. And up until that point, all of the chemistry that we used was, was what, we, what we call natural chemistry. And we've all but abandoned that in the last 50 years. But what's happening now is we now have lots of new pathways, lots of new ways of synthesizing things so that if we select natural feedstocks, we can, we can make newer stuff that's more functional, that's more sustainable out of that. And more importantly, I think, we're fundamentally reinventing feedstocks. So there are processes like biosynthesis and uh, other types of uh, uh, ways of coming up with green chemistry that allow us the efficiency of manufacturing those products and the functionality to literally engineer molecules that have never existed before that are far more sustainable and far more high performance. Uh, this is something that we're already doing in our, in our business. We have a number of products that incorporate uh, chemicals like this. And they're creating what, they're solving the age old problem in the green cleaning business, which is if it's green, it doesn't clean. Uh, I think we're, we're proving that that's not the case. And the way that we're doing that is really by leaning into uh, the development of these, these new technologies. And what have been your greatest challenges? Oh, greatest challenges. Uh, well, certainly some of the things that, uh, that, that uh, were mentioned, that Mike mentioned before, which the, the incumbency that current chemical suppliers have, the sunk assets that they have, is a real barrier. What it means is if we go to a large chemical provider and say, hey, we want all your innovative stuff that's brand new that you're coming right out of your R&D labs, that's all fine, well, and good. But when it comes to buying that stuff, there's no scale behind it. And if you really dig with those guys, you'll learn that when they make a 30-year investment that they're 15 years into, they're not going to throw away that $2 billion to build a factory to make the thing that you want. So what it means is we have to be very selective. And, and we end up doing a lot of joint development agreements with smaller startup companies that don't have the legacy assets of the larger chemical companies. That's not to say we don't work with the larger chemical companies, but we've had to do more of our partnerships and more of our development with companies that are like-minded like we are in inventing brand new ways of making materials. And then we have to find ways of providing value to them beyond just the pure volume of product that we can buy because we're not the biggest in our space. Uh, so that we provide value for them in a way where they can sell us the product that we need to replace whatever chemistry might not be as, as optimal as what they're producing. And, and they still have an outlet to sell more of that product elsewhere. Go ahead. Mike? Oh, okay. yeah. yeah, sure. Well, I guess I would um, ask uh, Adam, you know, one of the things that we've seen uh, on the Berkeley campus in launching the inter this interdisciplinary center for green chemistry is that uh, the students, uh, you know, chemistry students coming into the university have virtually no understanding of uh, these basic principles of how chemicals affect uh, human health, how they affect ecosystems, long-term transport issues. Uh, and, and so uh, it's difficult to get that whole group of, that whole population of students um, up to speed. And it also says something about, we, we don't have the technical and scientific capacity right now to, uh, uh, to scale up a large, a sort of um, large-scale green chemistry effort, um, and you know we've heard this from a number of businesses that they they just don't have the people coming in who have the technical skills to design a safer molecule. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you could comment on that. Yeah, I think it's absolutely a different skill set. I mean, we look for a very different type of chemist than ordinary consumer products companies. And we're looking for somebody that has that basis that, so that they can help define a, an entirely different toolbox of things that they use as starting points to develop chemicals and ultimately formulations for our products. It, it is a capability. It's, it's something that I think at the educational level needs to be addressed. I, mean, I, I, I graduated from this great university um, at, with a degree in chemical engineering and never had any training whatsoever in toxicology. It was a graduate level thing that I, that I never did. And so I think that's starting to be addressed at the, at the educational level, but I think also at the cultural level, we need to um, attack this problem in many ways, in the ways that hopefully my business is doing by, by hiring and employing people that have that mindset. Uh, love to see the public sector inve investing in creating new base uh, research 
around green chemistry. And it's starting to happen, but it is sort of frustratingly slow. But I think we need kind of a three or four pronged approach that way if we're going to see um, green chemistry really become uh, mainstream or to really usurp sort of traditional chemistry, if you want to call it that. Yeah. yeah. Can I comment back uh, on that? I think, you know, there's, um, I think of it as two things happening here. One is uh, the demand from companies that, you know, need, need chemists, they need scientists who could, who could sort of answer, for example, the question of, um, uh, that, you know, that Target has put out there. We, you know, we're screening now for uh, 1,200 chemicals or what have, you know, what have you, and suddenly the supplier of uh, any number of consumer, chemical consumer products has to ask, ask the question, how do we design that product in a way that is functional, it works, yeah. and, um, and it doesn't contain a bioaccumulative chemical. Yeah. And so uh, there's a, a demand side that seems to be starting to happen here with Target. Um, and, Calif and, and a number of others, of course. Yeah. Um, and California has just this last month passed, after 10 years of effort, <laughs> the safer consumer products regulations that are, go are first in the country and will start helping in that way. But again, I guess the, um, the question is, I think, on the, the supply side of, you know, what is it that we do to um, support the institutions uh, here, uh, you know, Berkeley, El throughout the state of California, who you know, they're going to be capable of training this next generation of scientists. Yeah, well, I, I'm not sure that there's a perfect answer to the question. I think that th we have seen in this neck of the woods, uh, this geographic area, the success of, of government, universities, and startups coming together to develop great technology, right? Not a lot of it's been chemical technology, but I think that in a lot of ways that model is something that we could apply to green chemistry, and if we were to do that, I think that we'd see a more rapid development of green chemistry. To just put a little shade of optimism on it um, as well, I think that regardless of anything that we do, this revolution is, is coming, and is coming a lot faster than any of us really realize. Uh, I've been kind of at the front lines of, of uh, several different partnerships that we now have with chemistry companies uh, here, mostly here in the Bay Area, but really all, all around the world. And the types of chemistries that are being come up with right now are, I mean, they're just incredibly cool. And they create amazing functionality. Um, we, we have a, just as one example, we have a, a, a green solvent in a cleaner that solves a, a lot of petroleum solvent issues that are raised in some of the body burden stuff that you talked about, Mike. And it's, uh, that's, a, that's a chemical that the life cycle impacts are one one hundredth of the natural alternative to the petroleum one. So you're seeing like this absolutely profound kind of change in the way that, uh, that our base chemicals are being manufactured. Of course, it's fragmented right now. But if you look in really any sector of the economy, there's a startup that's working on uh, incredibly cool technology. There's plenty of venture capital going into these businesses. And if we can combine that uh, with support, hopefully at the at the public sector level for our universities to get more basic research done in this area, I think you're going to see you know, a virtuous cycle start yeah. to happen real soon. If I could add one last positive uh, note to that, Adam. I, think, um, we ha I had the experience of sitting in the Chem 1A lecture last fall at, at Berkeley with its 2,500 students <laughs> in the lecture hall and the director of the Berkeley Center for Green Chemistry telling those, the students, uh, this is the challenge. Um, it's about designing safer um, materials um, that aren't going to bioaccumulate, um, and and you, it's on you, you know. And it's not often that you see 2,500 chemistry students give a standing ovation, <laughs> but I think the students are up to it. Yeah, it's incredibly exciting to this whole cohort of students, and that that's very hopeful to me. Thank you both very much. All right. Great. Thank you. Hold.